G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for uh, another another roundup, another summary of the second week of pre-season games. I uh, did a video like this a week ago and I thought I'd do another weekly sort of wrap up for the second round, even though I think a few more of uh, you would have actually been able to watch the game. Actually, I'm not sure. I think it might have still only been on KO and Fox. So maybe there's a whole stack of you who didn't watch the game. Either way, I'm here to give you a little bit of a breakdown of the important points from each game that we think we should pay attention to going into the season. Round one is only a couple of weeks away now, uh, which means we got no footy next Saturday, unfortunately, but the following week, it all kicks off. On that note, guys, a few people are asking, are we doing a footy tipping competition year this year and are we doing a fantasy league as well? The answer to both of those questions is yes. Uh, so if you were part of the footy tipping competition already, you don't need to do anything, if I'm not mistaken. It's already there, but I will leave the joining link to that in the description of this video. I haven't made the fantasy league just yet, so hold fire. Uh, that will be coming soon, so just watch the next video. That's the, that's the trick. It was an interesting second round of, uh, of fixtures this week in terms of the preseason games. Um, some of them were uh, A teams hadn't played last week, like in the case of GWS and the Bulldogs, um, and some other teams put in weird results compared to their first week of performances. So again, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Everything we're seeing here, there's a lot of variables going on with these games. So I don't really want to take too much out of the results, but there's a few meaningful things that happen in each game, which we can discuss. This video is brought to you by manscaped.com, sponsors of the True Footy YouTube channel. If you want 20% off and free shipping on all your male grooming needs, these are the boil ball wipes, boil wipes. Ugh. Still pretty hot here in Australia and Western Australia in particular. And uh, therefore, it's good to have something like the ball wipes if you're on a night out. It's good to make sure everything's clean and smelling nice. You've got the uh, ball toner and uh, also the ball uh, deodorant as well, which would come in handy, you know, if you're out on a night out and you have a potential encounter upcoming. Any purchases you make on the website, manscaped.com, you can get 20% off with at checkout using the code TRUEFOOTY20. You get 20% off and free shipping. It's a great product. I've got a variety of products, not just the body hair shaver. As I said, all those liquid formulations as well. Well, go check it out. Do your balls a favor. One last thing before we crack into the video, guys. I'm going to set an audacious goal of before I leave to go to America for the first part of my trip, I'd love to hit that 20,000 subscriber mark. At the moment, less than half of you who watch the videos are actually subscribed to the channel. So if you could do me a huge favor and hit subscribe if you enjoy the content, I would really appreciate it. Anyway, let's crack into the nine games. Uh, first of all, we had Hawthorne playing Collingwood down at Utah Stadium. And this one, uh, the first thing that struck me was this was a much better performance from Hawthorne compared to their 85-point loss against Geelong last week. So again, how much can we read into both of those results? I think Hawthorne are likely to be up and down this year. They got within six points of Collingwood in this particular game. Uh, the Pies notched the win on the back of Jordan Degoe. Uh, unsurprisingly, he had 31 disposals, 13 inside 50s to go with his eight clearances. So that was a really strong performance. And Tom Mitchell, unsurprisingly, comes in and has 28 possessions. This is the first uh, set of games where they're actually recording stats for us as well, which is handy. Unfortunately, it came at a cost, this victory. Uh, Pat Lipinski has dislocated his shoulder, so I'm not sure the prognosis on that yet, uh, but that is a pretty nasty injury. I think on the Hawks side of things, though, they'll be pleased with the form of James Warple, 30 possessions. He is a player that needs to come good this year with the O'Meara and Mitchell in particular leaving. It's time for him to stand up, and we know that he's a good player. Jai Newcomb, I can't believe he's only played like 29 games of AFL. He had 27 possessions, and Cam McKenzie, a player that I was big on in the draft, if you remember, he had 24 possessions and a goal as well. So he's a good chance to be a round one lock for the Hawks. Fergus Green was a bright spot for the Hawks as well. He was a delisted free agent for the Western Bulldogs. And I've made the comment before about Hawthorne's talls being a little bit young uh, this year, but he came in and kicked three goals. So he staked a claim for round one, which would be really pleasing. For the Pies, Dan McStay, their new key forward, kicked a couple of goals, which is nice, as did Connor McDonald, who kicked two goals as a small for Hawthorne as well. So I've probably talked a little bit more about Hawthorne there, but I think it was their performance that intrigued me a little bit more than Collingwood. We already know that Collingwood is a good side. The other Thursday game was Fremantle versus Port Adelaide. Uh, down at Fremantle Oval, and the Dockers got up by five goals and reversed their fortunes after a loss to Adelaide last week. The form of Nat Fife is probably the most pleasing thing to come out of the preseason from a Fremantle perspective. He kicked three goals uh, yet again. That's the second week in a row, all from general play too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, obviously, he's being played as a permanent forward from now, so if he's kicked three goals two weeks in a row, 
that's a really promising sign from a Frio perspective. The midfielders did what you expect them to do. Brody and Brayshaw both had 36 possessions. Caleb Sarong had 32 as well. It's an absolute jet midfield. Sean Darcy also had 38 hitouts, which again is not a big surprise. The performance of their key defenders was also a feature in this game. Pierce and Brennan Cox also held, uh, well, as I'm reading, that is an unfortunate combination of names. Pierce and Cox and Dixon, yikes. Anyway, Pierce and Cox did a good job of uh, keeping Dixon and Marshall to a combined one goal in this game as well. For the power, Connor Rosie, we already know he's a gun player. He was pretty gallant in defeat with 25 possessions and a goal. And Miles Bergman as well featured as well on a wing, if I'm not mistaken, had 27 possessions and a goal. Port Adelaide, interestingly, had 13 more inside 50s in this game, but were beaten both inside and out and on the transition by Fremantle, which is not a big surprise given Fremantle, you know, we're a good side last year. Frio possibly overused the ball at times was my observation, although that is kind of common with sides maybe without that key forward presence. And interestingly, Jai Amos sat out this game, which may indicate that he's not quite a lock for round one. Josh Tracy did kick two goals as a key forward target, so perhaps he's going to get the nod over Amos in terms of clinching a round one spot. Brisbane then played Geelong at Brighton Homes Arena and clapped him by 46 points. Uh, the two recruits, uh, similar to last week, as we said, in Dunkley and Ashcroft, kind of stole the show. And Ashcroft has got to be a lock for your fantasy team. If he's not already, I'd imagine he'd probably be one of the first players you pick. But he had 26 possessions and uh, missed the shot on goal. But 97 fantasy points in that particular game is uh, fantastic. We did hear that he was great last week, but now it's statistically recorded. Nearly a tonned up. Um, again, we've got a player on our hands. On top of that, Dunkley was probably best on ground. He had uh, 31 touches and 120 fantasy points as well, which shows that in his role here at Brisbane, uh, his production has not really dipped so far in the preseason. It's worth noting that the Cats were without Hawkins and Cameron in this game. They did fail to convert a whole heap of early inside 50s. They had something like 20 in the first quarter, which is crazy, but I don't think they kicked a goal in that time as well. But again, not too much to read into it. Stars were missing from both sides, um, and I think there were a couple of head knocks to Hipwood and Colour Jasney, but hopefully nothing too concerning coming out of this game for either side. Then we had the Saints play Essendon at RSEA Park. And uh, pleasingly, from a St. Kilda perspective, this was a much better result than their first performance last week. It looked like to be an improved performance, although you have to admit, looking at the scoreline, it was a bit of a stinker of a game. Interestingly, with no, uh, obviously no King and no memory, as we talked about last week, they're both unavailable currently. Uh, St. Kilda had Michito Owens play forward and kick three goals with something like 15 possessions as well, uh, which is a really timely boost as well. So on the flip side, unfortunately, Marcus Windhager, who's one of their best young talents, at least from exposed form from what I've seen. Uh, he's broken a bone in his hand, although he's considered a chance of round one. So hopefully it's nothing too serious because he is a good young player. Wanganeen Miller also continued some pretty good preseason form. He had 23 possessions in defense and Brad Crouch had 34 touches as well for the victors. Royal Marshall, again, unsurprisingly, was a big factor in this game. He had 24 touches 18 hitouts and a goal. By contrast, Essendon did look a little bit disjointed in this game. Their defenders in McGrath and Ridley uh, were among their most prominent in the back half, which kind of shows you where the ball spent most of its time. On the plus side, however, Will Setterfield came in and had 25 possessions for his new club. And uh, that's a real upside pick. Will Setterfield is now his third club now. But again, another high upside sort of midfielder and one Essendon would love to take his game to the next level. In terms of the youth in this game, Philippou, he had a goal and 15 touches. Alwyn Davy as well, looks like he's gonna be a good chance for round one for Essendon as well. He had 13 touches and a goal as well and was among Essendon's best. Sydney then took on Carlton down at Blacktown and Errol Golden has pulled out one of the most incredible individual performances. Even for a preseason game, this is impressive. He had 45 touches and three goals and on top of that, he had three direct goal assists amongst his nine score involvements as well. So an incredible performance. And I know it's only preseason, but this guy's got huge capacity. Like this guy must've been running for the whole game. I think he had 26 at, at halftime and had 19 in the second half as well. So this guy's got, he's got a serious tank on him. Not too sure what to make of the result, uh, broadly speaking. It was a bit of a wet night as well. Sydney are a good side. Carlton are a little bit underdone at the moment. Plenty of injuries going around. And in the second half, the pressure kind of lifted in this game. So it's a little bit hard to read how much to take out of it. We'll talk about some individuals. There was no Patrick Cripps, Cripps in this game, but Sam Doherty sort of split his time between defense and midfielder, which is a sort of what he's been earmarked to do this year. He had 34 touches, uh, which is not unsurprising for Sam Doherty. And Hewitt was typically busy as well. He had 25 to touch. 
touches and 13 tackles. It was a tough night for Keys given the conditions and Harry Mackay also didn't play in this game. So Kerno played pretty high as he needed to and he kicked a couple of goals as well. I thought Akers looked pretty good in his first game for his new club or second game actually. He had 20 possessions and uh, in terms of youngster watch, Oliver Hollands looks like he should play round one. I think he had 17 touches at about 76% disposal efficiency and Lockie Cowan as a running defender uh, also looks like he may play round one after a solid performance. The other pleasing thing from a Swans perspective was we saw Peter Laddams in action for them. He had 17 touches, something like five clearances as, as well. And Logan McDonald also notched up 10, uh, 10 marks on a pretty wet night as well. So some good signs in terms of the tall timber for Sydney. West Coast then got absolutely battered by Adelaide at Mineral Resources Park. And uh, the thing that really strikes you about watching this game was that Adelaide looked very much round one ready and West Coast looked a million miles from that standard. But it is a, it's a tough one to assess this game because logically speaking, we shouldn't look too much into, you know, preseason form. And even I've seen plenty of times in my time watching football where a team will look terrible during the preseason and then come out and be amazing in round one. And I don't think that will necessarily happen to West Coast here. But on the flip side, it is concerning that a lot of the same issues that plagued them over the last couple of years were present in this game, particularly the inside 50s. Adelaide were very, very good on transition. They had 65 inside 50s to 30. And by contrast, West Coast just couldn't get it past halfway, which has been an issue that's plagued them for a while now. Fogarty had a typically big day against the Eagles. He likes to do that. He kicked four goals. Ben Keyes kicked four goals as well, which is really, really impressive. And uh, Adelaide's damaging outside players, in particular Jordan Dawson, he had 26 touches. And Mitch Hinge also had 23 touches for him as well. And they looked really, really good, to be honest. They looked very fit. I know Burgess is now there as a fitness coach. I've already recorded my predictions video uh, before this this second week of uh, preseason games, and I kind of regret that because Adelaide look damn good, but it is only preseason. We must remember that. On the plus side for West Coast, Ruben Jinbit looks like he could be uh, an absolute star one day. He had 17 touches, wanted a really good efficiency, and almost set the standard for attack on the footy, which we kind of expected, but he's an absolute lock for round one. So that was something that was good, I guess. Now, but in all seriousness, don't know how much to make out of it. Training loads and stuff like that uh, will play a big factor. So if the Eagles put up a performance like that in round one, that's when I'll be concerned. But for now, I'm cruisy. Adelaide, though, look like a very well-coached side, and I'm intrigued how they're going to go this year. We then had three games uh, today on Saturday. GWS clapped Gold Coast, which is a little bit surprising, to be honest. Much of the predictions, uh, particularly by myself, have GWS quite low, and naturally we expect the Gold Coast to go up this year, but it was GWS who prevailed by 45 points in this game. Now, it must be said, Gold Coast did have a few players missing, in particular, Took Miller. Uh, it was a bit of a quite a young midfield that took on what is actually a pretty experienced GWS lineup. Lockie Ash was really good on halfback, so was Whitfield. That was a, a key factor in this game, was the runoff halfback. Finn Callahan, the youngster, had two goals and 22 possessions. We must not forget about this guy just because he plays for GWS. He was fantastic on a wing, two long-range goals. Uh, but by contrast, the Gold Coast young midfield couldn't really get going. Raul had 24 touches. Anderson wasn't really a big factor in this game. I'm not saying there's too much to read into that. But we did see Sam Flanders have 30 touches, and I have highlighted him as a player who probably needs a good year, and he, he's got some potential. So that will be pleasing for the Gold Coast Suns. But it was really all GWS in this game. Tom Green had 34 touches. Josh Kelly also had 36. So it is a mature and talented GWS side that's making me regret predicting them where I did in the video that's coming out soon. Pleasingly, though, I think for the Giants, uh, structurally, we had Riccardi kick four goals as that key forward. Uh, Himmelberg also had three, and Hogan had two. So nine goals between the three talls in the forward line there. It's been a bit of a question mark, the tall forward presence for the Giants, but this will be a pretty good result going into round one. Then we had the Bulldogs take on North Melbourne at Icon Park, and unsurprisingly, the Dogs had a fairly big win here by 58 points. This was their first uh, real competitive hit out. They must have, I think they played an intra club last week instead of the first week of preseason games. And today we actually had our first look at the Bulldogs. They did play a pretty tall forward line in this game as well with Norton, Jamara, Darcy, and Rory Lobb all playing, but they all kicked goals as well. Norton kicked four. Ugo Hagen kicked three, Darcy kicked two, and Rory Lobb won goal as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic shapes up going into round one. Do they pick all of them? I'm not convinced they will, but it'll be interesting to see if they do. We also see Liam Jones play for the Bulldogs, I would say, for the first time. But it's not for the first time, but we've seen him in his current capacity playing for them for the first time. He had 19 possessions, and 13 of those were intercepts as well. So he's kind of picking up right where he left off, and he's a big in for the Western Bulldogs this year. 
Liberatore had 33 and 2, McRae had 33, Smith had 30. Uh, but it was also the form of young Arthur Jones, which was a bit eye catching. He kicked a couple of goals and maybe presses a bit of a claim for a round one selection. For the Ruse, although the result didn't quite go their way, Simpkin had 31 touches and a goal, a player that I think a bit relies on his shoulders a little bit to take this group at least forward a step in 2023. I think he's a player with a lot of potential um, and he's becoming an important player for their fortunes in the short to medium future. We also saw Ben Cunnington come back and have 27 possessions, which is great. In terms of the injury front, there was a couple of casualties for the Bulldogs in this game. Hopefully nothing serious. We had Duray. Uh, he's gone, uh, been set off for scans on his neck, so hopefully nothing too serious. Uh, then Ed Richards had a cork and Crozier, I think, dislocated his finger in the second half of this game. Uh, the latter two shouldn't be too concerning probably be fine for round one. Uh, not too sure on Dureya, hopefully he's okay. We also saw Cam Zoha go off with calf tightness, although again, we're led to believe it's precautionary, so hopefully he's okay. The final game of the preseason matches was Melbourne taking on Richmond down at Casey Fields, and Melbourne had a big day out. They look in ripping form. They look like they're round one ready as it is, which is not always the best sign in terms of the length of the season, but can't really complain when they win by 50 points. We saw in Melbourne, we expected Petrarca and Oliver ran right, and Lockie Hunter again backed it up by being probably the third best mid on the field. But interestingly, we saw Grundy and Gorn kick three goals each, which was probably not something that we anticipated. So kind of hoping that's not a sign for the future. It is preseason, not too much to take out of that, but that is a pretty good performance for the two rucks. The Ds look really, really quick. They kicked the first six goals of this game before Richmond finally kicked their first goal. And after that, the game sort of evened out a little bit because the D's were already in front by six goals. Liam Baker played at halfback in this game, which I think with the inclusion of Taranto and Hopper, I think that's probably where he's going to play most of his footy permanently now. He had 36 possessions and something like 660 metres gained, which is really, really encouraging. Unfortunately, Dion Prestia has some terrible injury luck. He's gone down with a pec injury in this game. Unfortunately, I don't know the current prognosis on that, but hopefully from a Tigers perspective, he's okay because he is probably their best midfielder. Taranto also backed up a pretty solid outing in the first week of the preseason games. He had 120 fantasy points, something like 33 possessions and a goal or a behind or something like that, but he had a, uh, a pretty solid game, so we're pretty confident about the form of Tim Taranto going in to round one. So there you have it, guys. That is what I took from the second week of the preseason games. Let me know what you took out of the preseason games, what you agree with, what you disagree with from what I said. We do have some content coming up. I've got my season predictions dropping over the next couple of days, I hope. Then I've got a season preview podcast with Busher. We're filming that tomorrow as as well so hopefully that's a lot of fun and then uh sometime after that you'll see my round one predictions coming up then i'm getting my wits and teeth out so bear with me i will be a little bit quiet but i'm hopefully i'm going to schedule the video so you don't notice it too bad or i'll just record a video with a chipmunk face and you'll barely be under be able to understand me who knows we'll see but either way thank you for watching guys and i'll see you in the next video cheers